I'll say of the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall, everybody say, He shall, deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall, everybody say, He shall, cover you with His feathers and under His wings shall you trust. His truth shall be, everybody say, shall be, your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 tonight. See how far we can get along, okay? So we're going to deal where we left off last week. Remember, we're talking about Him as being your sustainer. The Lord is your sustainer in the adversities of your life. Everything that's going around and coming back at you, you need to understand that He will sustain you. To sustain you means to keep you from yielding or failing during stress or difficulties. I'm going to say that to you again. To sustain means to keep from yielding or failing during stress or difficulties. How many of you are glad for that? Because we live during stressful times, don't we? Difficult times. And if you think it's stressful now or difficult now, hang on. But in the midst of all of that, you don't have to fear, you don't have to worry, because while the rest of the world is crumbling around you, God will sustain you. Psalm 55 and verse 22 says this, and I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He shall, everybody say, He shall, sustain you he shall sustain you he shall say it again he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved slip fall or fail you get that now notice here the first thing that you're going to have to learn to do notice he says there for you to cast your burden upon the lord you see, the Lord wants to sustain you. He wants to carry you. But He's waiting for you to cast those things upon Him. Why? Because that's an element of trust. Remember there in verse 4 of Psalm 91, it says, Under His feathers or under His wings shall you trust. Right? Isn't that what it says there in verse 4? He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings shall you, what? Trust. So you have to trust Him to be your sustenance, to sustain you. When the economy is going down the, down the toilet, listen, count on Him to sustain you. When there's no food at Walmart, don't worry about it. God will sustain you. If you remember, in the Old Testament, many different times when Elijah the prophet was in need of something, God always told him, go do something. And when he did something and he spoke to somebody to give to him, God always brought sustenance. Like the woman with the, uh, the young boy that she was going to make a cake and feed the two of them and then lay down and die. And he said, make it for me first. You see, when you first give it to God, then God multiplies. And as soon as she gave it to the man of God, immediately the barrel of meal didn't empty nor did the uh, cruise of oil empty there was plenty to go all the way through the time of famine you see when we learn to lay it over on god and give it to god first he's a sustainer of everything that we have in our life and we need to understand that and sometimes we get in here's that word that we used a lot last week fear Fear comes in when you see the bank account empty, when you see the, the grocery shelves empty, when you see uh, bills that need to be paid and you're not paying them. Fear enters in. That's when faith needs to kick in. And you need to believe God that He will sustain you and that He shall, like His Word said. If you cast your burden on Him and you know you've done your part in your relationship with Him. Did I say that? Y'all get that? 
that when you know that you've done your part in your relationship with him, God will always keep his word and he shall cast your burden on him. He shall sustain you. He'll never cause the righteous to slip, fail, or fall. That's good news. I'm not bound for failure. I'm not bound for falling. I'm bound for victory and to be more than a conqueror because that's what Jesus brought me to this place in my life when I met him. Immediately, I became someone who was more than a conqueror. I became victorious because he already won the battle on my behalf. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? Okay. So in the midst of all of that, learn to trust him. God will never allow you to slip, fall, or fail. Look at verse 8. Look what he says. He says, well, we're, uh, we'll read verse 7, but I want to skip to 8. It says, a thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. I'm going to get back to that word it in a minute. Only with your eyes shall, behold, shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. And the reason I wanted to get to that, because we're talking about God sustaining you. Okay? Now, when you stop and think about this, just for one second, notice here, he says that your eyes you shall behold and see the reward of the wicked and we talked about a couple of people last week who god sustained in the midst of trials and tribulations and testings that were going on remember shadrach meshach and abednego and daniel remember them now we know the story how that they refused to to bend their knee to the idol to worship uh, that king and to do whatever that king wanted them to do and to and to forget about god and they said no. And they knew we know that they were going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. Now watch how the word of God worked for those boys when they cast their burden onto the Lord and they spoke victory. They didn't speak defeat. Nowhere did they ever speak defeat. We'll not bow our knee. If you throw us in the fire, God will rescue us. If you don't throw us in the fire, we're still not bending our knee. That's the words they spoke. So the King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he got all ticked off and he got some men and he heated up the fire seven times hotter than it would normally be heated up. Now watch. The men that grabbed those young boys and threw them into the fire, bound up, the scripture declares unto us that the men that threw them into the fire were consumed by the fire outside of the furnace. I want to see this in light of that scripture. He says, only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. What was the reward of the wicked that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got to see? Those men who put them in the fire that died. So they beheld the, their reward. So listen, when evil people do stuff against you today, and we know there's a lot of them out there, I mean, there's a ton of stuff going on right now. But listen, we're going to watch and see their reward. Their reward is exactly the thing that they have been sowing. They are going to also themselves reap. Let God do what God does the best. And we're all famous for complaining and and bad mouth and this and bad mouth and that and sure wish this would get done and this that i'm as guilty as anybody else but god said this he says vengeance is mine saith the lord i will recompense and with our eyes we are going to receive the reward of the wicked have you all seen the movie sound of freedom if you haven't seen it go see it and pay for somebody else's way to go see it or whatever. There is a perfect example right there. We are going to see the reward of those wicked people. We already saw them and some of them in that movie. They got their reward. They died. So the things that you're seeing evil in the world today that are coming against you as a believer, as somebody who stands as a patriot, somebody who stands on the side of righteousness, You'll see the reward 
but only with your eyes you will see it. So let God take care of it. You pray it through. You do your part in righteousness, but you watch what God will do. You watch, okay? How about another one with Daniel? Remember Daniel? We, got the, we talked a little bit about this last week, too. When Daniel was praying and he was forbidden to pray, remember the king passed a, the law that said nobody can pray? Daniel went ahead and did, prayed out loud, opened the window even. <laughs> and they came and they threw him in the lion's den, and all he had was a good night's sleep with a bunch of kitty cats. Now watch. The scripture declares unto us the next morning when the king opened the pit and looked down in there and saw Daniel just walking around, just having a good old time and scratching the kitty under his chin, pulled him out. What happened to those men who threw him in? The scripture says that those men who threw him into the pit along with their wives and their children and their family members were thrown into the pit and they were devoured by the lions. Only with your eyes shall you see and behold the reward of the wicked. What was the reward of the wicked? And what is the point of the family members along with the men who threw them in there? There has to be a cutting off of the generational curses that come when people are unregenerate. Why do you think that in the Old Testament they told them to stone rebellious children? Because they were cutting off the rebellious blood. I know that sounds evil and cruel, but that's what God did. He cut off the rebellion, and that was the way to do it. Stop the seed from growing and multiplying. Today we have the blood of Jesus that cuts off generational curses. That was Old Testament. We don't stone our children today. Tempted a couple of times, but never do. <laughs> but the thing is, that's why he would... That's like with uh, Achan and his sin. That's why not only did Achan have to die, but all of his children and his wives and their cousins and aunts and uncles, that had to be cut off because there was a rebellion that was arising against God and against righteousness. That's why they had to all be cut off. So trust God to take care of what needs to be taken care of for those who are coming against you. God will vindicate you. He will. He definitely will. Get you, just make sure that you stand where you need to be standing in the right place with God. Go with me to Deuteronomy 28. I want us to see this again in another light. Yes. Real loud. Amen. That is so true. And God does that. God does so many great things when you obey his word. But first, obedience has to come from you in order for there to be a release of the promises of God. I, I always go back to when we lived in Brea, and I went out in the backyard that time. You were uh, out with your Mary Kay doing whatever you were doing that night and we had that lumber out there and there was all those cockroaches i went out in the backyard and i saw those cockroaches in the backyard and they were just everywhere on that lumber pile and i looked at those and i and i said lord and i was a new believer right i was testing out my faith <laughs> and i rebuked those things i said lord you said you rebuked the devourer for our sake and we've been faithful in the tithe and these cockroaches they're a destroyer and they need to be destroyed in the name of jesus i curse them i went back inside went back outside they're all dead I remember Rick and Georgia. They had bees in their house. One day, Georgia, the, she was good, they were good friends of ours down in California. She was cooking in the kitchen, and she heard this going on. She walked back to the bathroom, and all of these bees coming out of the drain of the bathtub. 
she closed the door on it and she did the same exact thing lord we're tithers and you said you'd rebuke the devourer for our sake and i command those bees to die in jesus name pretty soon there was dead silent just a bathtub full of dead bees <laughs> you see god's word works if you will put it in your mouth and release it in faith. Watch what God will do. We could tell. We could stand here and tell stories all night long about the faithfulness of God on the things. But you see, we had to release what belonged to Him. The tithe doesn't belong to me. That's why God said, "Will you rob me? Because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Him. And if I keep it, then I've stolen from Him. And if you're going to steal from someone, God's not really the best choice. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean." <laughs> Don't steal from anybody. But look at De Deuteronomy 28. Talks about blessing and cursing. The first, uh, what is it? The first oh, 14 verses of chapter 28 deal with the blessings when we walk in obedience to God. If we'll do this, we'll be blessed in our bless basket, blessed in our store, blessed in our when we go in, blessed when we go out blessed all the way around. We're all just blessed. And the blessings of God will overcome us. They will overtake us. That's what Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14 talk about. And the rest of the chapter talks about cursed shall you be <laughs> if you do this. You'll be cursed when you go in, cursed when you go out, cursed when you lay down, cursed when you stand up, cursed whenever you put your hands to. How many of you know, I prefer the blessing side of that. Don't y'all? Watch what comes in a part of the blessings. You know, we talk about blessings. We always want to think about prosperity and joy and peace and, and health, which are blessings, right? Watch this. Verse 7. The Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and they shall flee before you seven ways. <laughs> Doesn't that sound just like Psalm 91, what we just read? Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. I'm in the blessing camp. Not because God favors me, but because I chose to obey him. So that releases the blessing. And because I'm going to obey him, guess what? He will smite my enemies right before my face. You watch. You keep watching. Keep watching and be patient. Watch what God's about ready to do. Don't be surprised when you wake up one day and the news tells you all kinds of good stuff about things that are going on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, back up there to verse 7. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right, but it shall not come nigh you. Now, I'm looking at this today, and I'm just going like, this word it just keeps on coming up. And you know that when something bothers you like that in a good way when you're reading the Word, you better just put the brakes on and just look at it. So I just kept on looking at it. I'm going, I pull out my different translations. I do this and I do that. And then I bypass it and go back again. And I can't, couldn't get rid of the word it out of my head. Sometimes I'm a little slow. <laughs> look. What it says, a thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. What is the it? How about we back up to verse 3? Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. There's an it. From the noisome pestilence. There's an it. When you think about, remember what a noisome pestilence is? It's an eagerly coveting destroyer or plague. Hmm. An eagerly coveting 
destroyer, or plague. How many of you know that's an it? That shall not come nigh you. He shall cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall trust. His truth shall be your shield and buff buckler. Here's another it. Verse 5. You shall not be afraid. Fear is an it. It's probably the biggest it out there. Fear is the basis, I believe, for all spiritual problems. That's my opinion. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night. There's an it. You shall not be afraid for the arrow that flies by day. That's an it. You shall not uh, be afraid for the pestilence that walks in darkness. That's an it. Nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. That's an it. A thousand of these shall fall at this side and ten thousand at your right side. When the enemy ties to pit back up his dump truck and just offload on your life, it'll not come near you. See that? Yeehaw. Where does it begin? Verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You've got to stay in the secret place. Keep yourself hidden. And remember, we talked about this way at the beginning of this study. Our life is hidden in Christ Jesus. Remember, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Remember, seeking is trying to find something. If your life is hidden, Christ, he can't find you because you're hidden in him. <laughs> Isn't God so good? Amen. Hallelujah. So, here we are. A thousand will fall at your right, ten thousand at your right hand. It shall not come nigh you. Another scripture that I like to use in that particular instance as well, is Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no judgment or condemnation to them that be in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's verse 1. Notice that the condemnation, the judgment, cannot come against you while you're walking in the Spirit, and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. If you're walking, fulfilling the lust of the flesh and outside of the Spirit, then there's condemnation and judgment that could come. So while we walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh, then verse 2 comes into play where it says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Think about the power and the authority that comes with that. Okay? So make sure that you're doing your part in order for God to do his part. God's always, always willing. Okay? And he's always looking for faith. The eyes of the Lord, the scripture says, says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, searching, seeking, on behalf, to show himself strong, on behalf of those whose heart is upright towards him. So God is looking to show himself strong on your behalf when your heart is upright toward him. Doesn't mean that you're absent from attack. It means that you're absent from defeat. <laughs> Got to think about that. Okay, so verse 9, because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation, there shall no evil, everybody say no evil, befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. What's the pre prerequisite? The word because. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, you have made him your 
habitation. The prerequisite in making the Lord your habitation and the rewards become all of the promises in the next verses all the way down. Okay? What's the first one? No evil shall befall you. The word befall means to have a quarrel with or to happen on you. Befall means to have a quarrel with or to happen on you. So no evil shall have a quarrel or happen on you, nor shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. In other words, evil cannot take you by surprise and defeat you. Evil cannot take you by surprise and defeat you. When all of this pandemic was going on, out continually, right there, that verse was coming out of my mouth all the time. No evil shall befall me, nor any plague will come nigh my dwelling. When there's sickness that goes around and everybody's complaining about this flu or that flu, that's, that comes out my mouth all the time. If the devil tries to take and attack my body with sickness, I'm doing the same thing. I'm constantly speaking that to my body all the time. But you see, that's the word that you've got to get inside of you to get it out your mouth. This word of faith which we speak, okay? Speak, speak. You have to let it come out your mouth. If it's in your heart, it'll come out your mouth, okay? So no evil befall you, nor any evil befall you, nor any uh, plague come nigh unto you. Look at Psalm 34, 19 real quick. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You know, a lot of people use this verse pathetically. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's true. <clears throat> yeah, oh, what is what? Oh, woe is me. Oh, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And I'm just going to thank you, Lord. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Why don't you read the rest of the verse? But the Lord, he what? delivers them out of them all. Yeah, you and I are going to go through trials. We're going to go through tribulations. We're in this world, but we're not a part of this world. And that enemy of your soul, he hates you with a passion. Do you know why he hates you so much? <clears throat> Do you ever stop and think about why he hates you so much? Because you're created in the image of God. And he wanted to be God. He exalted himself. And wanted to be above God and wanted to sit on the throne of God. God just kicked him out of heaven. And then God made you and me. And it really ticked him off because God made you and me in the very image of what he wanted to become. That's why he hates you so much. He can hate me all he wants. I'm his master. He's not mine. <laughs> Think about that. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord he delivers them out of them all. You need to couple that with that particular verse of Scripture. When those things come along, religious people will love to just come over around you and wrap their arms around you and comfort you in your affliction. Come on, let's be honest. But the best comfort you can give me in any affliction is pray for me. Stand in faith with me. Don't pity me. How many of you understand Jesus never pitied anyone? He moved with compassion. Compassion is fostered by love. Pity will hold you in, in bondage because it comes alongside with the pain rather than delivering you from the pain. Don't pity people. Stand in faith with them, okay? No plague come nigh your dwelling. <clears throat> Go with me to Exodus chapter 8. I love this portion of Scripture. I just love it. Exodus chapter 8. No plague come nigh your dwelling. 
You know, Exodus 8, we're going to be dealing, talking about the plagues that came on, on Egypt. During the time when God was setting his children free and Pharaoh was hard-headed about it, hard-hearted, hard-headed, <laughs> and wasn't going to turn it loose. And all these plagues that came. And God did something during the plague of flies. Watch what it says there. In verse, uh, oh, verse 20. And the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he comes forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon you, and upon the servants, and upon your people, and into the houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever, look what this says, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and your people tomorrow, shall this sign be now you need to get a hold of something that's so powerful right here remember there that it says that no plague shall come nigh your dwelling what's your dwelling there you go that's right this is your dwelling that's your house this is your dwelling okay you can call it your house too it's the temple of god but this is your dwelling Notice what God said he was going to do in that day when that plague came. He was going to sever the land. That means that there would be going to be a division. If we could put it in, in a natural where you could make a visual for it, you could just say that he sent out a million bricklayers and he just laid out this great big wall between them and Egypt. <laughs> Make that big div division. Here it is. That side belongs to Egypt. This side belongs to Goshen. That's God's people. That's the devil's people. Now, where you and I live today, that God is severing the land. There's a division between the world and the church. There's a, war there's a division between the righteous and the unrighteous. The blessings and the cursing. There is a division between that. And while we stand in faith and we keep our lives in line with what the Word says, and we don't submit ourselves to the world way and we submit ourselves to the Word way, there is going to be a division between the devil's people and God's people. Now, I just love this portion of Scripture in verse 23 where he says, I will put a division between my people and his people, or the devil's people, or the Pharaoh's people, and tomorrow, this shall be a sign to you. I always have this picture of the children of Israel, wherever they went in the Old Testament. Remember, even Balak wanted Balaam to curse the children of Israel because Balak said, all the children of Israel, God's people, wherever they go, they win every battle. They have more than enough to eat. They have, they're, they're prosperous. They're healthy. Everything about them because God is on their side. And if we, if you don't curse them, we will be submitted to them and we'll always have to be conquered by them. <laughs> so that's why Balak wanted Balaam to curse them. And Balaam couldn't do it. Matter of fact, he got rescued by a donkey. <laughs> so the thing is that I always see that wherever Israel went, it was a signpost to the rest of the world of the faithfulness and the powerfulness of Almighty God. And you and I are the Israel of God. Read the book of Galatians. You'll discover that. We're the Israel of God. We should be a signpost to the rest of the world. When the world's having a pandemic, the church is just going on without masks and without hand sanitizers. We're doing wonderful. 
Okay. We're, we're walking healthy. When the economy goes down the tube, we've got bread on our shelves. It's a signpost to the rest of the world that God is still God. He's still on the throne. He's still supplier. He's still healer. He's still our protector. He's all in all that he said he was going to be. So when I see this particular scripture, and there's another one, like when the plague came over the darkness of, of Egypt, it said, but there was light in the land of Goshen. I love that scripture. So the thing is, is we have to understand, that's why Psalm 91 is so important that you understand where it starts. It starts with our decision to make him Lord, make him God, make him our hiding place, make him our refuge, make him our source, our goal, and walk in faith toward that. Watch what God will do. I, I could t All night long I could tell you about the faithfulness of God and how he has blessed us. Blessed us. I, I, it's just it, unfathomable all the things that he has done and continues to do. So go to Exodus chapter 15. Let's see another portion here where it deals with God's faithfulness and our commitment to be faithful to him. Again, very familiar portion of Scripture. Children of Israel come out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea. A couple days into the journey, now they come to the waters of Marah, the place where the water is bitter. They couldn't drink it. Remember, Moses cast a tree. God showed him a particular tree to cast into the bitter waters to make it sweet. Beautiful picture of the cross, how what we take the cross and cast into the bitter waters of life that makes it sweet. Beautiful picture. Then he says this, verse 25, And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made them a statute and an ordinance forever. And there he proved them and said, Now watch what God says to you and to me. Okay? If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. Don't read anymore. I want you to notice there that he didn't say if you'll go to church and you'll hear the sermon and just do whatever you want to during the week and then just come back again on Sunday and hope you can remember what was taught last week. Follow what I'm talking about? He didn't say to do that. He said, not only will you give place to my word, but you'll do my word diligently. You follow that? Okay. Then he says, you'll do that. I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rophe. What? I mean, if you understand that God doesn't alter one word that goes out of his mouth. What the psalmist said. What one covenant will he break? Not one word that's gone over my lips will I alter. So if God said that the, I'm just going to put it maybe in modern day vernacular. Read the word, believe the word, speak the word, do the word, and you'll get what the word says. Easy enough, right? I used to say a lot, and I still say it. I haven't said it in a long time. But if you'll, if you picked up that book and you read that book and you'll do what they did, say what they said, believe what they believed, you'll get what they got. Because that doesn't change. God's not a respecter of people. Okay? So, do what it says, and no plague shall what? Because he says, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I put upon the who? Egyptians. When did he put upon the Egyptians? When the Egyptians were holding Israel captive. Didn't put them on the Israelites, he put them on the Egyptians. 
God doesn't put sickness on. Ah, it just makes me so irritated. Believers, oh, God gave me this sickness so that I could minister to those people who are sick. He brought me back to the hospital so I could just talk to those people and just help pray for them and make them all well. Right? Uh-huh. Why couldn't he just put you in there healthy and just pray for them to get up out of their bed? Does he make you sin in order to minister to sinners? Oh, I don't think so. Okay. So why do we have that kind of dumb theology going on? Huh? <laughs> yes, true. That's that's true. True. Proverbs twenty six two says that the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, Satan's junk comes close to us when we get close to it. <laughs> Makes better sense to you? Without a cause, the curse won't show up. If you keep your hedge there, you keep your relationship, right? You live like you're supposed to be. The curse can't come because you've built a hedge of protection and the Lord is hedging you in. You didn't break the hedge. You still have that buckler, that shield about you. You're still under his feathers, under his wings. You're still trusting him. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that keeps you in a place of sustaining. I don't know. It keeps you sustained by the Lord. <laughs> Best way I know how to say it. Okay. Now notice verse 11. And we got a couple of couple of minutes left to go. Go back to Psalm 91. And listen, none of this, before, before we move into this, none of this is designed to make anybody feel guilty that you're not maybe doing something that you should be doing. It's designed to awaken you to do what you need to do. So don't ever feel like, oh, man, I feel so guilty. You made me feel so content. No, that's the devil and he's lying to you. He's just lying to you. Don't believe that. This is to build you up. This is to strengthen you, to get you to the next place of believing with God. Because we are coming into a time that you're going to need this minute more than you've ever needed. We, we, can we say we've been on cruise control for a long time? We really have. And it's time to click the cruise control off and start doing it the way that we're supposed to be doing it and believing God. Okay? So, verse 11. For he shall, everybody say, he shall, give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands unless you dash your foot against a stone. So we won't get through all of this tonight, but we're going to talk a little bit about angels. But you need to understand that God has angels over your life. And for a while, there was a teaching that was going around that said that we can command angels to do this and to do that. I don't find that anywhere in the Scripture. God commands His angels. God commands His angels. I've never seen an angel... Darlene Doobie, who, bless her heart, down in Arizona, I hope she's staying cool these days. She would, several times while I was preaching, she would see an encampment of angels up here behind me while I was ministering work. I would just love to just turn around and see them. Our son saw an angel. He was fearful about, over this, what was it, a stuffed animal or something when he was a baby? A little monkey that my mom made, I guess. <laughs> and uh, he was fearful of that. This thing, I guess, just creeped him out. And one night, angel of the Lord showed up. He saw him, put him at peace with it, fear gone. God is just good that way. You have to come forward or speak really loud, Donna. Yes.
Right. Right. Amen. Yeah, that's the presence of the angels that God has assigned to your life. Absolutely. Years ago, uh, 1973, I went to Alaska to build some homes uh, with a couple of guys. Driving up the Alaskan Highway in the Yukon Territory. I was driving the truck. Two guys were in the back of the camper. This truck did not have a window between the camper and the and the cab of the truck. There was no communication that way. I fell asleep on the Alaskan Highway in the Yukon Territory. If you know what the Yukon Territory looks like, it is like God forsaken country. It just, it's terrible, it's barren. Cliffs all around you. I fell asleep and the next thing I know, upside my face. What did you say? <laughs> A bear. <laughs> angel bear came to the rescue. That had to be God sending an angel to wake me up because we'd have died. Because we'd have just been right off the cliff. And there, listen, that was in the days when if you saw one car on that highway, you were lucky in that whole thing. That was back. I mean, that was we broke an axle in the truck. That's how bad the road was. But, well, Ronnie's brother lost a dash off his motorhome going that way. So, <laughs> But that's how much God cares about you. Bill and Donna in that rollover accident. Angel of the Lord protecting the peace of God that came with that. I didn't know the Lord back then. I knew of the Lord. You know, I mean, who doesn't in America? you got to you know, have your head buried in the sand if you don't know that God exists, right? So I know God saved me for a purpose and a reason. For that beauty right there. My mother-in-law, what does she say? I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know. Your husband's th th thanking me for the last 40 year, 45 years. He hasn't had to support her. God has his angels charge over your life. And if you'll stop and think about it, we're getting out, running out of time, but think about it this week, because we're going to do a little bit of study about the angels. Think about times in your life when you got rescued one way or another and it may have been by somebody that you saw rescue you but remember the scripture says be careful who you entertain for they may be angels unaware so you be nice to me i might be an angel my wife says those are shoulder blades not wings so <laughs> but it's so true you just never know who may be there it could be an angel of the lord that comes by and the scripture is full of visible angels that appeared and helped other people but god has given them charge over you so you need to trust god that that angel who is on assignment for your life yes Two angels on your front? Oh, good. Hallelujah. You weren't in trouble. God was blessing you. He was showing you his love. <laughs> How many is watching over Mark? <laughs> but you got to be blessed to know that God cares enough that he, every person on the face of this planet, and I'll prove that to you next week, Every person on the face of this planet has an angel that's assigned to them, whether they're a believer or not a believer. That's right. I'll show you that next week. Aren't you glad for God's care and his love? That's part of his sustaining, isn't it? Hallelujah. 
Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that we are trusting in you to sustain us in every situation, every circumstance that's coming down the line. Father, we're trusting you. We're believing you. We're going to stand firm. We're going to stand strong. And we will be that signpost to the rest of the world of your faithfulness and your power and your ability to keep your people through all troubled times. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's thankful people yelled, Amen. God bless you. Amen.